On Earth, there exists an individual with supernatural powers that have the remarkable ability to transform the impossible into reality. That person is Seiki, a pink-haired boy who has antennae on his ears. Seiki saves a dog from an oncoming car. Sixteen years ago, an ordinary family joyfully welcomed a child who was anything but ordinary. By the age of 14 days, the child demonstrated the ability to communicate without vocalizing. Additionally, by one month old, the child displayed the remarkable ability to move in a walking motion, albeit in midair. At just one year old, Seiki willingly accompanied her mother on a shopping trip, demonstrating its helpful nature within seconds. Nevertheless, Seiki continued to feel as though he were the most unfortunate individual on the planet. He possessed the extraordinary ability to accomplish anything. Yet he couldn't find any joy in his achievements or be genuinely surprised by unexpected events. When the father arrived home, he asked the child to pick the lock because they didn't have the key. Afterwards, he placed the blame on the mother, accusing her of changing the lock. It appears that there is a significant amount of tension between this married couple as they frequently engage in arguments and question each other's love. In the evening, the entire family enjoys a delicious dinner of pork ribs while the father opts for a plate of ribs made from working shoes. The father attempts to voice his complaint loudly, which leads to him receiving an additional shoe as a bonus from another pair. He then asks his son to turn his shoe into a steak, but the child does not comply with his father's requests. The father has to finish his meal, but the smell is unpleasant. He was required to lick his boss's shoes while at work, and now he finds himself having to lick his own shoes at home. The mother gently holds Seiki's hand and expresses that his ability should be used solely to assist those in desperate situations. This makes Seiki perceive his mother as a kind-hearted individual, but he soon realizes that this is not the case. She immediately suggests that he create a hammer in order to smash his father's head. This is an example of how peaceful an evening can be for a family. The dinner is a success. The father attempts to eat Seiki's portion of the ribs while he is about to enjoy his dessert. However, the mother intervenes by lifting the entire dining table and hurling it directly at him. Thanks to Seiki's ability, the table is fortunately held in midair. However, instead of using his superpower to bring peace to his home and allow himself to relax and enjoy his dessert, he chooses not to. The mother takes his food abruptly and offers it to the father as a way to make amends, resulting in another evening filled with chaos. Seiki is a student at PK Academy, and today is the school's open day. When reminiscing about preschool, it is clear that Seiki has an unbeatable advantage in the game of rock-paper-scissors due to his ability to read people's minds. Despite the teacher's attempts to defeat him, he emerges victorious a hundred times in a row, completely overpowering her. The teacher is extremely angry and has the urge to throw a surprise punch at Seiki, but she refrains from doing so. Following the incident, the teacher in question is no longer seen at the school, causing a significant shift in focus towards Seiki by many individuals. So, he has to learn how to hide his abilities from others. However, there is one individual at school who Seiki cannot influence with his powers, Ricky. Seiki couldn't read Ricky's thoughts since there were none in his mind. Ricky attempts CPR on a student who falls unconscious during the ceremony. It's as though he wants to kill the individual rather than save him. Not only that, but he also gives that student rescue breaths. When the student is taken to the hospital, he rushes to the sink and vomits. His first kiss went to a boy. Ricky claims he feels the same way. At that point, a teacher overhears their talk and discovers that the student lied about his illness, prompting him to investigate. However, the boy blamed Seiki and Ricky, and Ricky later claimed that he was suffering from a virus-related ailment that caused a high fever. The teacher instantly took the student's temperature and discovered it was 92 degrees Celsius, so he summoned emergency medical assistance. Seiki used magic to conjure fire and accidentally burned the thermometer, but Ricky felt Seiki had contracted that fictitious ailment as well. As a result, Seiki was taken to the hospital. People who do not think with their brains are extremely hazardous. Another character appears, Shun, is a man suffering from a delusional condition. He keeps telling his pals about an evil secret society made up of snakes, centipedes, or anything, but no one listens. So embarrassed, he goes outside and enters the restroom. When Seiki sees all of this, he immediately conjures a snake in the classroom exactly as Shun indicated and lets it run free with the panicked pupils while he waits in the lavatory stall next to Shun. Ricky mocks his classmates for being cowardly while the classroom becomes a shambles, but he faints when he finds the snake has bitten him in the crotch. Sean enters the classroom after a brief period of crying and confronts the serpent, striking poses and chanting nonsense. Meanwhile, Seiki is still in the laboratory 
killing the snake with lightning, and the entire class believes Shun has abilities, while Shun himself becomes even more insane, believing he is the chosen one and even talks back to a teacher. Once everything is resolved, a new character appears. Kakomi is her name, and she is really gorgeous, drawing a lot of attention from everyone. When she spots Seiki on the street, she knows he's in her class, so she decides to approach him primarily with the purpose of seducing him. Seiki, on the other hand, ignores her and reacts indifferently to her little display. She believes Seiki is simply too astonished and embarrassed to express his affections, so she repeatedly follows him and tries to touch him. But Seiki avoids her. When they arrive at the throne, Seiki observes Riki walking in front of them. Ricky turns around directly back at him just as he is hoping Ricky won't notice him, so he won't have to recognize Kakomi. Seiki teleports without thinking after being shocked. Takomi is astonished to discover that Seiki had vanished. She approaches Ricky and inquires whether he has seen Seiki, to which Ricky responds that he has not. She even begins to believe she is hallucinating and imagining Seiki. Kakomi imagines she fell in love with the pink-haired classmate, sticking to the idea of adoring someone so much that you could nearly see them everywhere you went. However, Seiki has been standing on the roof of a tall building for a long time, entirely uninterested in such delusions. During the next physical education lesson, the entire class competes in a dodgeball match. In the dodgeball game, Seiki tries to intentionally get struck in the face so he is eliminated, but his team captain, the class president, declares he is safe because of the face-safe rule, so he now has possession of the ball. Seiki has always struggled with modulating his strength when throwing dodgeballs, having previously broken an iron ball. The leader encourages Seiki to throw it as he means it, but Seiki knows there will be casualties if he does so. Seiki throws it lightly and Ricky catches it. Then Ricky eliminates one by one each member of Seiki's squad until only Seiki and the class president remain. Ricky launches a hard throw at the class president, but Seiki catches it as he prepares to exit the court. But instead, the class president catches the ball with all his strength, forcing him to tumble in his pants, restoring hope to Seiki's team. If he flips the script, he will garner a lot of attention. But if he gives up, all of his comrades will curse him to death. So Seiki utilizes his power and discovers that the average favorability point is 42, implying that 50 points will assist him in avoiding drawing attention and will keep him from being a victim of bullying. As he eliminates the first guy, his score rises to 56. It's Shun's turn to hold the ball. He attempts to brag then throws like a female. The entire class looks at Seiki as if he'll die if he doesn't catch this ball, so he has to catch it. And in doing so, he directly eliminates three other players on the opposite squad. Finally, when he decides to quit, the class president sacrifices his pants once more to preserve the squad so they win. And Seiki receives an 82-point favorability score. It's too high, so he searches for a solution to lower it. But then Ricky appears and hugs him, bringing the affection score back down to 46. What a time saver. Everyone his age is looking for a romantic companion these days, and there is a lady in his class who likes Seiki. As a result, she begins to make arrangements to create a connection with him. She first hides in a hallway corner and pretends to run into him. But Seiki easily dodges and neatly organizes the paperwork she drops for her. All of her subsequent plans fail owing to Seiki's talents. The weather appears to be preparing to rain as they prepare to leave at the conclusion of the day. Seiki, who is untouched by her illusion, stops the rain. Then another boy approaches her and confesses to her, leading her to believe that her real love had arrived despite the fact that she was desperately attempting to win over Seiki. The next day is about a moving day and Seiki's father instructs him to utilize his powers to carry some of the items because he is too busy carrying his wife. Just as Seiki is about to move the bed, his clumsy father knocks it down on the ground. Not only that, but he tries to impress everyone by raising the bed with one hand, nearly killing himself. Seiki tries to shift the mattress, but it becomes stuck everywhere. One end becomes entangled on the balcony, another on the wardrobe, and yet another at the door. The solution is simple, he just breaks down the wall to make more room. He fixes the wall and leaves everything as it was. After a full day of shifting, Seiki utilizes mind control to make everyone on Earth have distinct hair colors, blue, red, purple, and yellow, in order to avoid drawing too much notice, so his pink hair wouldn't be overly noticeable. He also alters the human body's ability to heal, allowing patients to recover faster. Consider Ricky, who has already grown back the teeth he lost when a baseball hit him in the face. Seiki's other hypothetical principles include the fact that torn clothing retains its integrity in key locations. That size no longer correlates with strength, 
and that one punch to the neck is enough to make a person unconscious. Even at the school gate, if a disruptive pupil raises a commotion, the teachers can just strike him in the neck and knock him out. Someone writes a letter to Seiki in the following chapter, claiming to be aware of his abilities and wishing to become his disciple. Someone rings the doorbell just as Seiki was going to use his powers to find out who authored the letter. The unidentified writer's letter has just arrived when Seiki meets Rita, a spiritual diplomat who can see and talk with spirits. He introduces himself, stating he's had the talent since birth. When he was younger, he couldn't tell the difference between ghosts and humans. But because ghosts have no physical form, his grandmother advised him to try to touch them. He hugged her after taking her counsel, only to discover she was not human. Then Grandpa rushed to soothe him, but as he passed through his transparent body, he learned the harsh truth. Rita then continues to hug other individuals to see if they are ghosts or not, something he appears to be quite interested in when it comes to beautiful girls. He claims that there are 15 trapped souls in Seiki's chamber, with one of them rubbing their buttocks against Seiki's face. Following that, he wishes to be Seiki's student in hopes that he will accept him. But Seiki is thinking about what he said about an unseen bottom hanging in front of his face, and he tells him to leave swiftly using his powers. However, when Seiki accidentally touches Rita, he inherits Rita's spiritual psychic skills and discovers the entire room is filled with ghosts. The next morning in class, Seiki hears about a new student who can see guardian spirits, and he quickly recognizes him and takes Rigida to the restroom, asking him to transfer to another school right now. Seiki then constructs a spiral-shaped sword out of toilet paper and threatens Rigida, leading him to become terrified and remain silent about his power. A group of girls approaches Rigida as they are about to return to class and inquires about their guardians. One is a warrior, another is a noble, and the third is a beggar. Rita informed the guys that they were all accompanied by old people, which enraged them. Shun boldly moves forward, assuming he has prehistoric creatures as protectors, but it turns out to be the spirit of a chihuahua. At that point, Ricky approaches Rita and inquires about his, but Rita utterly ignores him. Rita understands Ricky is a genuine person until while they are on their way home from school. He then takes Seiki to a temple and introduces him to his guardian spirit, who happens to be Ricky's father. Rita assumed Ricky was a ghost because he resembled his father so much. Seiki's parents must attend a wedding, therefore, he must clean the house alone. He puts his clothes in the washing machine and goes to take out the trash, but he finds a cockroach and teleports to the other side of the earth, his legs still trembling. Despite his invulnerability, he cannot read the thoughts of little creatures to determine what they are thinking. As the doorbell rings, Seiki swiftly returns to his room and teleports through the first level where the cockroach resides to deliver a package for his mother. When he opens the door, he is welcomed by his friend Ricky rather than a delivery man. He flees again, afraid, but returns requesting Ricky to catch the bug for him. Ricky smashes the cockroach right on the spot. Just as he is going to tell Ricky to put them outdoors, that night Seiki's mother returns and buys him a box of chocolates, but she loses part of them, causing Seiki to think of cockroaches and teleport to an island in the Republic of Palau. A new day starts, and Seiki goes to study as usual in class, but a female keeps looking at him compassionately. It's the girl from the beginning of the series who dated someone else after failing to communicate with Seiki. However, due to her boyfriend's terrible habits and vulnerabilities, it appears that she is becoming bored and wishes to quit the relationship. Seiki is concerned that if they break up, the girl will pursue him, so he assesses the issue in order to assist this pair love each other more. The girl has a 57 affection score for her lover, but it dips to 54 when he forgets it as their three-month anniversary. Seiki remembers and prepares a gift for her. After using his psychic power on him, ordering her to close her eyes, he takes out a half-eaten dried squid packet that he plans to offer, but Seiki instantly transforms it into a cuddly rabbit. They then go to a claw machine game and win plush animals together, raising their affection score to 90. However, when they go to a restaurant in the evening, all of his red flags appear. He yells at the staff, the stink of his feet is free in the air, he uses chopsticks like an alien, and he has the habit of eating loudly, which causes the affection score to plunge. As the girl sobs her way out of the restaurant and breaks up with her clueless boyfriend, Seiki becomes increasingly concerned about his own future well-being. Seiki is shown traveling along the school corridor on his way home. He expects to come home with enough time to watch his favorite anime show, which will run at 5 p.m. one hour later. Seiki abruptly leaves because he detects something and wishes to escape. Shun, who is hunting for him nearby, discovered an abandoned house and wanted to invite Seiki there. 
but Seiki was uninterested in his new hiding place. Haro is already waiting for him at the top of the steps. He changes his course once more, but Kakomi is still looking for him. Seiki avoids them all, but he comes to a halt when Riki emerges out of nowhere and invites him to eat ramen. With nowhere else to go, Seiki chooses to hide in the restroom and use his powers to track down people who are hunting for him. He can't leave the school anymore since Haro is watching the door, Sean is at the lockers, and Kakomi is enlisting the help of all of her slaves to find him. Seiki has to resort to making himself invisible, but it only lasts 10 minutes and will fade if someone touches him. Seiki slips out of the bathroom stall quietly, heading to Shun's locker and drops it, scaring him and causing him to scream, drawing the attention of Kakomi and Haro. It's time to flee, but he collides with Rita, revealing himself. In the end, no one knows if Seiki returned home or not, but one of the Kakomi slaves is still seeking for him even though the sun has set. We then focus on the school's sports festival. Overall, Seiki's team performed admirably. The first race was a running race in which he finished third, but everyone was shocked because he was the only contestant who did not specialize in running and sprinting. Shun came up next, but his run was the polar reverse of what he had shown the public, which was feminine and small. The scavenger hunt race followed, and Ricky was the first to finish. They each received a piece of paper. Ricky then glanced at the paper before reaching for Seiki's headpiece. Saki fainted as he extracted the piece. The satellite energy chart became chaotic, and the prophet predicted the end of the world. When he awoke, the chart returned to a stable level, and the prophet declared everything was okay. It was found out that the two buttons on his head helped him regulate his power, which he has hit since he was a child and has grown stronger and stronger to the point where he can easily destroy the moon and blow up his entire house while sleeping. He will lose control of his power if they are gone. The tug of war competition follows. The abilities were so strong that they tore his gloves, forcing him to pull the opposing team up into the sky, resulting in his team's victory. The following game involves throwing bean bags into a basket. Seiki merely used his psychic abilities to catch them and hurl them into the basket of his team. His team received 83 bags, which was quadruple the number received by the other teams. But the last team received 100 bags, which surprised everyone. They had stuffed 100 bags into a larger bag and threw it in their baskets. They cheated but claimed it was in good faith. Finally, there's the relay race in which you pass the baton twice. The team's initial two members finished last since they were the class's two athletic prodigies. Ricky turned the tables by rushing swiftly with a very unusual attitude, and Kakamaran graciously congratulated herself in her mind. But before she approached Harrow, he tripped. However, by the time he gets inside, he has already escaped, and Rita is mistaken for a thief. He was convicted of a crime despite the lack of proof. Returning to Seiki, when he wakes up in the morning, he discovers that all of his psychic abilities have vanished. He can't hear people's thoughts streaming into his mind, and his punch no longer bursts through the wall. But then he hears an explosion and falls unconscious. It was all a nightmare. It turns out that his dreams are typically foreshadowing of what is to come. Therefore, it is now his goal to save people before the explosion he heard occurs. In reality, he saves humanity from a horrible explosion by picking up a random rock on the ground, halting a chain of events known as the butterfly effect. If he hadn't picked up that rock, a schoolgirl wearing a miniskirt would have stumbled on it while doing a somersault kick, sending the boulder flying to a truck as the driver dropped his windows and was hit in the temporal region. If that motorist had been unconscious, he would have stepped on the throttle pedal and driven right into a petrol pump. The gasoline would have then begun to leak. Meanwhile, the female sleeping in an unsuitable position would have drawn unwanted attention from a passing male scooter rider, his scooter slipping away in the leaking gas, creating an explosion. By throwing that rock aside, Seiki accidentally smacks Ricky in the head with it, leading him to believe it was a meteorite that had fallen on his head. Meanwhile, Harrow had delivered an ungodly quantity of kerosene to the instructor's room for the heater. Ricky surely showed Shun the rock, claiming it was a meteorite. But Shun obviously understood it simply as a rock, so he threw it away. But it falls inside a classroom window near to the kerosene where Harrow had left them. A student sprints across the hallway since he is running late to be the class helper. What is unavoidable occurs, that student trips on the rock, causing it to collide with the lead light tube, breaking it, and then colliding with the kerosene line in the corridor. The electric spark from the light tube almost strikes the now leaking gas, but Seiki intervenes just in time. From then on, it's evident that even the tiniest problem has the ability to escalate into a massive event. 
Whether you want it to or not, it is up to each individual to determine whether they prefer dogs or cats. Although their skeletal structures appear similar, cats are typically more aloof and act as if they are the masters of their owners. Cats and dogs are the same to Saki because he just sees their skeletons and muscles, but because he can read minds, he finds that cats are incompatible with him. After a bit of walking, the protagonist comes across a chubby kitten locked in a cave with many thoughts. Saki thinks he'll just pass by, but after passing by the cat, he returns, then slowly leaves again, giving the cat the impression that he doesn't want to preserve such an attractive cat. Saki turns back and asks the cat if it wants to be saved from there, but the cat remains aloof, claiming that if Saki saves it, it will love Saki. Cats, in its perspective, remain at the top of the pyramid, while such filthy creatures as humans must love and care for them. Seiki walks away after finishing talking to the cat. However, after departing, the cat requests Seiki for assistance with a really terrible attitude, since it hasn't given up on acting like it's a noble animal. After saving the cat, Seiki walks away casually, unaware that the cat is plotting revenge on him. Seiki's father brings the exact cat home that night, intending to keep it while it fantasizes about turning his house into its kingdom. The mother throws it out since she is allergic to cat fur. There's also Christmas. When Seiki gets home from school, he sees that all of his pals have come over, and his father has dressed up as Santa Claus. Seiki's father frowned in embarrassment as he removed the fake beard and greeted Ricky, but his thug-like behavior caught him off guard. Ricky sat at the dinner table, upset that he had never received a gift from Santa Claus. When pressed, Ricky's father reveals that he died a long time ago, so the Santa suit was done once more. But this Santa Claus gets stuck opening the door and has to enlist the assistance of his wife. Ricky, too, couldn't believe it was Santa Claus. Ricky received two gifts this year, one from Santa and one from his mother. Ricky's mother, it turns out, always places a gift near his door before he goes to sleep on Christmas Eve. He became emotional when he realized that every mother is wonderful in her own unique manner. They went to a shrine to pray, Seiki's father being the flirt that he is, prays to his mother, stating she is his goddess, but then turns around and wishes to win 200 million yen in the lottery. They agreed, shun with a trailing scarf. As they prepare to return home, Ricky and Hero are also present. Then, Seiki's father wishes he had a lover, which Seiki believes is impossible. But then Kakomi arrives immediately behind him. So the entire cast has arrived, and his parents have invited everyone to their home for some New Year's delicacies. After some discussion, Seiki's mother inadvertently tells his friends about his psychic abilities, which piqued everyone's interest. The parents attempted to divert the conversation, but that didn't work out in their favor, so Seiki had to go out of his way to erase the keyword psychic powers from their minds using a banana. It undoubtedly has drawbacks because something has been removed from their memories. Individuals must fill the gaps with something generated by their subconscious brains. It turns out that Seiki's buddies now want to be even closer to him for fictitious reasons. The PE instructor at Seiki's school is notorious for his severe temperament. He is constantly taking students' things since they don't pertain to their studies, therefore, many students despise him. Some of them go so far as to plot an embarrassment of the teacher. They write a love letter that appears to be from a female high school student, and place it in his locker to expose his true twisted side. After reading the letter in the lavatory, the teacher decides to meet with the student to settle matters. Using his mind-reading abilities, Seiki learns about their plan, and after the teacher has waited all day for that pupil to arrive, he transforms himself into his feminine disguise and meets him, to the pupil's astonishment. The teacher is not a pervert, as he attempts to reject Seiki as gently as possible. Seiki uses psychic powers to warn them because they were the ones who forced him to accept rejections from a middle-aged guy. Eventually, he breaks their cover, and the teacher recognizes them, feeling horrible. The kids promptly recognize their mistake and repent for what happened, learning that he is only severe because he wants the best for them. Valentine's Day is approaching, and the air is thick with love. Rita is hallucinating about how many chocolates he will receive for his perverse behavior in front of the females. But Harrow doesn't need to wish for it because he is popular and kind. Thus, he already has a big number of thanks and friendship chocolates just as he believes. A boy runs up to him and hands him a heart-shaped chocolate, which he interprets as a gesture of appreciation. In Shun's case, he finds a bag of chocolate under his desk. Shun initially believes it is the Dark Union attempting to capture him. When he gets a closer look, he gets butterflies in his stomach because he knows it's chocolate. Shun mistakes the inscription on the cover for a present from Kakomi, but it's actually a prank by Ricky. They both had no chocolates for Valentine's Day this year. 
Ricky is comforting Shun about it when a girl interrupts, claiming she wants to give Shun some chocolates, making Ricky depressed as now he is the only one who has no secret lovers. Valentine's Day has become a nuisance for Kakomi since some chose to spread the information that she brought chocolate to school. All of the men at school are trying to win her over so she will give them chocolates. In reality, she brought chocolate, but it was ostensibly a thank you gift for Seiki. However, seeing all of the boys outside the female lavatory, Kakomi throws the chocolate out the window, not wanting a global war to break out if they discover the chocolate is for Seiki. Seiki had been standing under the window the entire time, so he caught it with ease. Today, Ricky asks Seiki to hang out from the window but receives no response since Seiki is hiding in his room, refusing to leave. After Ricky leaves, Seiki intends to resume his reading, but when Ricky's father approaches him and attempts to elicit a reaction from him, Seiki pretends not to see him because physical attacks are ineffective against Ricky's father. Seiki decides it would be quicker to simply teleport to another location, which he does, but Ricky's father still finds him. Clearly, teleportation is insufficient. Seiki creates an electric ball and throws it at him, but he is unmoved. Seiki, perplexed, seeks Rita's assistance as he is Rita's guardian, after all. Rita is clearly irritated that he has been interrupted mid-lewd magazine competition. But according to Seiki, no spirit medium can stop a ghost. After threatening to kill Rita, he ultimately realizes how to stop Ricky's father by enlisting the assistance of another ghost. Seiki then separates his soul from his body and sends Ricky's father flying only to realize that Rita has tattooed dung on his physical face for a short while. Seiki's mother is a very giving woman who buys everything salespeople offer at her door. Yet, the hallway is often crowded with boxes of over-marketed things. Seiki's mother apologizes to him for being a fool and buying meaningless things worth up to 1 million yen. Seiki can't blame her for only wanting the best for her family. He then utilizes his abilities to return all of the things and the money. Seiki's father offers to assist his wife in fending off those salesmen. But Seiki knows he won't be any different because he is easily swayed by praise. Finally, Seiki uses forced telepathy on his mother to relay the salesman's unfiltered ideas to her, causing her to chase him around the streets. Seiki discovers that his telepathy is no longer with him when he picks up a ring box that the salesperson has dropped. Further investigation reveals that the ring is composed of germanium, which disables his telepathy abilities. This brings back memories of his boyhood when he went to the movies. Spoilers always got to him through other people's ideas, rendering him unable to concentrate on the film. So, if telepathy goes away, Seiki wants to know what it's like to attend a movie in a theater. As he walks to his booth with a plate of food, Seiki runs into an unpleasant man who doesn't seem to mind that he made him drop all of his food. Seiki, who dislikes meeting Kakomi the most in this situation, ignores that impolite man and returns to his seat. It turns out Kakomi is there with someone, and that someone is the actor who plays the film's protagonist. Finally, everyone recognizes him, and the show is cancelled owing to the uproar. The cat that Seiki rescued is still standing in front of his house. Saki merely wants to pet the cat as a show of respect, but he has little interest in furry animals. His father, on the other hand, has a tremendous affection for cats. Therefore, he always feeds them and looks for occasions to pet and rub the cat's tail. The cat's expression is solemn as it looks out onto the street, and it turns out that another female cat is going by while devouring the food that Seiki's father had given him. The orange cat was astonished to discover a strange man on his shoulders. Seiki turns to the other cat, but because he's in animal shape and unable to control his powers, he punches his father senseless. The orange cat is terrified, yet it attempts to appear confident. Seiki intends to pair the ginger cat with the female cat of its desire. After urging it to follow him to visit the female cat, they intend for Seiki to behave as a pervert to the female feline so that the ginger cat may come to her aid. But the roles are reversed, and the female cat wishes to mate with Seiki instead. As a result, Seiki now has two cats constantly waiting at his front door, one seeking to mate with him and the other wanting to knock him out. Seiki cannot play games since his magical talents will constantly ruin the fun. So, he buys a game that no one wants to play. But it turns out that the game contains every bad gaming flaw imaginable. He plays from the afternoon to the evening and completes a mission. After he fixes his broken console, the game rewinds to the first unskippable cutscene. Seiki and Ricky meet Shun's mother, who appears to be a nice and generous woman but is rigorous when it comes to studying. When Ricky asks them about their preferred university, Shun's mother makes both of them work on notebooks while she takes Shun outside to chat with him. Shun is obsessed with her son's schooling, as any mother would be. 
She thinks the Seiki pair is a horrible influence on him, and his poor grades have affected her. Shun disagrees and says he wants to stay friends with them, which causes Seiki to have a different opinion of someone who has the 8th grade condition. Seiki completes all of the workbooks in under 10 minutes, which dramatically transforms Shun's mother's opinion of them. They are now considered prodigies. As much as Sean appreciates his mother allowing him to have the boys around, he is ashamed when his mother discovers his diary, which contains information on the Dark Union. One of Rita's classmates has a crush on him. He knows everything about her because he is friends with her guardian, a middle-aged man. Rita wishes to enlist Seiki's assistance in convincing her to do anything he desires, but when Seiki declines his offer, he is determined to win her over on his own. So, he accesses a womanizer spirit to assist him with flirting. Riva's consciousness returns just as he is about to kiss the girl, and he is smacked across the face for making such a vulgar kissing expression. Reed and now alters her intentions by creating a harem series, leading to possess him as the man can captivate any lady he meets. Everything appears to be going swimmingly as the ghost apologizes to the girl for what happened. But just as she allows him to kiss her, he falls over a banana peel, knocking her down. Rita suffers another smack, and he will never be able to win over the girl of his dreams again. It's strange for Kakomi, a popular girl, to have so much on her mind when she might have anything she wants. Seiki has recently occupied her thoughts, as has Shio, the orange-haired girl with an ex-boyfriend full of red flags. They happen to meet on the streets and decide to hang out in a local cafe. It's an awkward situation because they don't talk much at school, but finding out they're both dreaming about the same person is lucky because they don't understand they have a crush on the same person. Seiki will have a lot of problems on his forthcoming journey now that he has two secret fans hunting him. The three-day school trip to Okinawa is approaching, and the two girls intend to travel with Seiki. They aid each other since they don't realize it's an enemy who has been by their side the entire time. As much as they want to be with Seiki, Kakomi's notoriety has brought her a lot of disadvantages because the class president decides to play it safe with the lottery due to too many boys wanting to pair up with her. Despite the fact that Kakomi and Shio received the first paper for Seiki's squad, Seiki wants to avoid them as much as possible, so he swaps the writings, leaving the girls as side characters. Luckily for Kamai and Shio, Seiki is matched with a female trio who despises Riki, so Kakomi offers to trade teams with them. She effectively kills two birds with one stone. She may now be with Seiki while seeming to everyone else as a deity who believes she sacrificed herself. But in the end, she must form teams with another group because one of her classmates is unable to accompany them on the trip. While Seiki is having dinner with his family, Kakomi's older brother, Toru, a famous actor, rings the doorstep. He asks Seiki if he's going on a trip with his sister, and after getting permission, he tells Seiki not to hurt his beloved sister. Toru insists on accompanying Kakomi after threatening Seiki, but Saki won't let Toru ruin everything, so he gives the ticket to the student who couldn't acquire one so that there are enough people on the plane. When we arrived at the airport, there was a storm which delayed our flights. It shook everyone to their core. Seiki was not particularly enthusiastic about this trip, but when he realized that everyone enjoyed it, he promptly soars up to clear the storm, and the journey resumes. Shun becomes ill on the flight, so Seiki teleports home to buy medicine for him. Then it's the green-haired boy's turn to have a stomachache, so he turns his body back one day only to experience the same pain the following day. The plane's turn to malfunction is on the verge of crashing, but Seiki helps it land safely. They sit on the bus to the rest stop to eat and drink before splitting off. The females eat snacks while the boys from Seiki's group walk to the green snake store. Only dumb Shun buys the entire set to collect snakes. After a succession of offers, they are divided into rooms in the afternoon, and it's time to eat at 6 p.m. It's time to bathe in the open hot spring after eating, but the lads want to see the girls bathing. But why are they only able to see Ricky? The boys then notice giant Ricky and sit in a corner feeling sorry for themselves. Kakomi and the others are ready to go to Seiki's room to play when he teleports to the beach and falls asleep. Seiki is nowhere to be found at this point, so she goes to the beach to play. She then notices Seiki lying there. She playfully rips out one of Seiki's controls, and when Seiki awakes, the entire hotel has vanished. When Seiki approaches, he takes out a mound of bones in a ship's body worth the equivalent of a motel. Fortunately, he is able to return the hotel to its proper place in time. But when he learns that Kakomi is in the forest and under attack by a bear, Seiki immediately transports there to save Kakomi. The mesmerized females mistake Rita for Kakomi and request that he accompany them back to their room for a nice night's sleep. After tossing the bear aside, Seiki transports to a location that sounds rather lovely. 
He then transfers Rita to the location and mesmerizes Kakomi to see Rita as him before falling asleep. Everyone has breakfast together the next morning as usual, and Kakomi is still thinking that Seiki had appeared in her dream the night before and was taking care of her, so she is delighted. They board the bus after lunch and drive to the beach to swim. Yumi gazes at the sweet meal before jogging in the morning in order to have a slim body in time. They go to the aquarium in the morning and the beach in the afternoon. The lads continue standing outside the girls' changing room for one reason. Kakomi in a swimsuit and her stunning appearance have everyone staring in admiration. Yum goes out cautiously, but luckily in her old-fashioned bikini. Many people gaze at her because of her breasts. Fume is sitting alone under the umbrella when Shun approaches to strike up a discussion. Shun's cheeks flush a little scarlet at the time, leading her to believe that the other person was drawn to her bikini. But as Kakomi approaches, he is so taken with it that he somewhat assaults her three times. There are two males out there flirting with Kakomi at the time. Shun stands up and strikes that person. After Yoon comes out to defend Kakomi and receives abuse from those two men, they both bend their legs and run because they don't feel any pain. Shun is now a new person in Yum's eyes, and she is falling in love with him. The second day of the picnic has come to an end, and today is the final day. So Seiki's party begins wandering around and buying groceries. Despite their disagreement, Seiki had just one goal in mind, the advertised Ultra Rare and Mitsuru Red Bean Coffee. The group has to split up now. When the girl group leaves the cafe, it's just these two. Ricky is drawn to the blazer stand, and Shun is drawn to the Vipers, so no one can stop Seiki from drinking the red bean coffee. But on the way, he meets a boy with blue hair who is still suffering from stomach trouble. Next, he sees Kakomi's brother, Toru, so he mesmerizes the bad guy into seeing an ugly person as Kakomi. Then he accidentally hugs him, and now they're blocking his path. Seiki goes to a nearby snack restaurant and finds his entire gang sitting there. The other five had already ordered the red bean coffee ice cream but they blend their separate servings into one giant cup and give it to Seiki to eat. He cracks a rare smile and begins eating with everyone. The party comes to an end, and today there's a new transfer kid named Aaron at school. Everyone thinks this person is amusing, but he rushes to the bathroom to vent his rage. He used to be a true delinquent since both of his parents were. He wanted to stir trouble double everywhere he went, but he restrained himself. He was furious after hearing Ricky's gypsy triumphs such as holding mosquito incense to kill a mosquito, or stealing and then biting an entire watermelon at a wall corner. A bully robs a student of money with nowhere to vent his rage, so Aaron snatches up the entire cabinet and throws it square in the face of the bully. He hadn't been to class in over a week, but he hadn't made any friends, so Aaron has to go and strike up a discussion. He notices Seiki and assumes he is weak, so he approaches him, but Seiki gives a terrible look prompting the boy to leave voluntarily. Shun contacts him again, and he tells him all kinds of lies. He met Rita when he went out, but that was it. Then he became upset. Then he unexpectedly met Kakomi. Next, he met Hero. He actively befriends Aaron and states that he has an opponent to fight, Ricky. Aaron walks in to examine Ricky, hoping to see how strong he was, when he hears Ricky summoning his companion. So there's another guy who's as strong as Ricky. That guy turns out to be Saki. When he notices that everyone is staring at Saki, he knows that Saki is the boss. Ricky invites Sean and Saki to his father's grave today. When he is about to depart, Ricky's mother arrives and encourages them to play at their house. Saki is still puzzled as to why Ricky's father's soul did not escape when Ricky's father realized Saki could see him. He begs him to assist him in confessing his affections to his mother so he can rest. So he extracts Ricky's soul to allow his father to temporarily utilize his body. And if he does not return the body within 44 seconds, Ricky would perish forever. So the father walks over there and swiftly hurries to confess to the mother. And finally, he can speak his heart, thinking he has died. But the mother does not recognize it was her husband making the father angry and unable to flee. Near his coffee shop is losing clients because the coffee shop next door has recently opened. The employer is likewise in a bad mood because he barely made a living but had to pay his employees and rent for the retail premises. So Seiki and the two of them collaborate to come up with a solution. They begin by changing the service outfit and then meticulously draw a few more advertisements and slogans for the shop. Seiki understands that given his talent, it would be easy to acquire customers but he prefers for everything to unfold spontaneously, and the shop's coffee jelly is still delicious. That's correct, and frequent customers would ultimately return. Shun recently finished seeing a detective movie, and now he wants to be a detective and investigate. There was a broken glass case at school, and Shun begins investigating as well. 
The school also misplaces a bottle. After a while, he says that Taco was the one who stole the vase, but it was true that he was carrying a vase, so he smashes it. Natsu advises him to go home, fix the vase, and then confess to the principal. Together, regarding the other broken glass, Seiki remembers that he had forgotten his umbrella at school the night before. So he uses a tennis ball to exchange the umbrella, and he unintentionally lets the tennis ball shot through the mirror, breaking it. Ultimately, it's Seiki's fault, not anyone else's. Hiro, the class president, is very active and urges everyone to participate in the upcoming school festival. He proposes folding 50,000 paper cranes, 1389 per person in a month, which stuns the entire class. Other ideas begin to emerge, and the entire class becomes enthusiastic. So Seiki utilizes the meteorite to rush into the class, and it's at this point that Heo comes up with the idea of displaying meteorites and odd stones. Reed's gang forms a band, but Reed sings like a chicken. Another guy doesn't know the chords, another can't tell the difference between the guitar and the bass, and another only knows how to play drums in the game. As a result, Reed wishes to solicit Seiki's assistance. Seiki puts on a mask and demonstrates his abilities, making all three guys gasp. After that, he teaches everyone one at a time. The guy who played the piano like a dying cicada yesterday now plays very nicely. The guy who didn't know how to play any chords yesterday plays very melodiously. The guy who didn't know anything yesterday now knows how to beat the drum to the point where his drum could drown out the cursing of the butchers in the market. Rita used to sing like a laying duck, but now he can strike high notes. Today, everyone brings out all of the weird stones to show off, and Ricky even brings a Buddha statue. Shun, Seiki, and Ricky decide to try their luck at the haunted home after viewing other classrooms. Shun is a coward with a large ego. When they uncover a pile of costumes, the three of them dress up to terrify others. But when Shun spots Ricky's mother, she faints and has to be taken out. It turns out that Ricky's and Seiki's families also came to see them. Ricky snatches Seiki's glasses to play with while Seiki is in the bathroom, slightly cleaning his face so that if Seiki looks directly at somebody, they would be horrified. When Seiki's father enters and sees the Ricky statue, he becomes quite delighted, and Seiki hurriedly takes his spectacles to block his ability. Seiki's father is aware that this was the petrified Ricky at the time, but he inadvertently breaks the statue. He contacts the police after speaking his final words to his son to confess to killing someone. It's wonderful to be self-conscious, but luckily, Seiki employs his healing talents. When Ricky's mother enters and sees the Ricky statue, she realizes it's too loud. She's astonished because she assumed Seiki had made it. So the entire statue is carried to the exhibition class, and as a result, he wins first place in the class with the most appealing program. The boys in the class continue to play with the statue, and a neighbor boy climbs on it and pushes it over. Luckily, Seiki is stuck on it, so the statue doesn't break. The class is having a hall party that afternoon, and three fellas, Seiki, Shun, and Ricky, have not yet arrived. They become disoriented from afternoon to evening and eventually arrive at the gangster's hideaway. They apprehend Seiki and the three in the wooden house, but Seiki teleports them away. By the time they arrive in the classroom, the class party has concluded. They should have stayed at home. Toru, Kakomi's brother, adores his sister. He even covers his eyes and sits in his sister's room while she changes her clothing. He goes to complain to Seiki that his sister no longer wants to talk to him after that incident, and requests Seiki's aid. So the next morning, Seiki goes to transmit Toru's remarks to Kakomi from a distance. Kakomi is worried that his brother is going to disturb him again, so she apologizes and sincerely offers Seiki to go out with her because she has already requested a day out. It's acceptable. She assumes Seiki is glad because he can play with her that afternoon but he just goes out with her because he respects her too much. After walking for an hour and still not finding a snack bar to visit, all the males collect and bring her and Seiki to a nearby bubble tea store. Following that, the entire party sits down to play nearby, with Seiki and Kakomi sitting at a separate table. Seiki can tell Kakomi's brother has come and is about to enter, but the gate immediately stops him. They exchange briefs there before departing. Seiki and Kakomi are preparing to leave. At this point, the beer was meant to cost 68.50 yen. But because Kakomi is so lovely, it is reduced to 200 yen. She has a 20 yen voucher. They keep going, but Seiki is about to go home. But on the way home, Toru is already resting there, so they decide to go play at the amusement park. She expects Seiki to cave into her demands, but instead, he uses all of his turns to dominate each game, sending Kakomi home disappointed. Seiki is seated on a chair resting when he spots her brother, Toru, immediately behind him, and he grabs Kakomi's hand and runs. Kakomi blushes slightly when she notices Seiki clutching her hand. 
They dash behind the curtain using invisibility magic to hide the others from seeing them. And Kakomi reddens even more. Seiki dresses up as Santa Claus and hands gifts to youngsters during Christmas. His father would distribute gifts to children in the city, but his back pain since he carried big goods, so Seiki has to go distribute them. They want Santa to enter through the chimney at the next house, so he complies and then transforms into a rice-powered spider web cleaner. She also chastises Santa Claus for being filthy and states that she doesn't want to touch any new gifts. After one o'clock at night, he arrives at another house and sees that there is an argument going on. The father has important work to accomplish in this household, and the mother prefers that he stay at home with her children. When the youngster asks Santa to help his parents reconcile, Seiki travels to the company to complete all of the tasks while also leaving a gift for the boy. Seiki has already received fortunate money from both his father and mother, but he still requests a little extra from his father due to the several times he has assisted him in the Christmas event. His father being late to work and his father spilling coffee. So with a little money, Seiki goes out and gets a new TV because the old one broke three years ago, and he always had to return it to the state it was in the day before. So now is the time for it to rest. This may have been the worst discount, therefore, the employee seeks to sell additional items to compensate. Finally, a coffee jelly maker with 40 batteries piques Seiki's interest. This lures him in. Regardless of how powerful he thought he was, everyone returns to school with many fresh stories, such as the cold, the hectic meals at the start of the year, and the days of going to pray and ring the bell. Weight increase during TED is probably no longer unusual to us. It's simply that I don't have the nerve to step on the scale immediately following TED. Finally, Seiki receives the New Year's card on which Kakomi personally pasted the heart, but she has yet to receive a response. She assumes Seiki is probably practicing writing a lot in order to surprise her, and Saki says, What the hell, I never practiced. Shun wanted to ask for money. When he notices two gangsters blocking Aaron's way to school this morning, Sean observes this and intends to rush to call for help. But when he turns around, he sees Aaron beating those two guys and strangling another guy. Shun is terrified of Aaron and is still unsure whether he is a genuine mobster or not. Aaron exhibits a massive figure while changing into workout gear, which makes Shun nervous. Baseball is the day's gym lesson, and a ball is launched directly against Aaron's head, leading Shun to believe there would be a large brawl. But Aaron proceeds to play normally, and luckily it is pouring, so no one gets wounded. Shun accompanies Seiki when four criminals stop him on the way back. At this point, the four rush to vanquish Shun, but are unsuccessful. Even the boss, who is about to defeat Seiki, has his stick broken by Shun. But it is all a dream. If the dude took the iron stick and bashed it into the wall, Shun would collapse and swiftly hand over the wallet. Shun pushes the other person away and instructs Seiki to flee while they are stealing Seiki's money. At the same time, Aaron passes by, and Shun calls for Aaron to run with him. This is nothing to a true mobster. As a result, Aaron knocks them out one by one in an instant. On the drive home, Shun informs Aaron that the past doesn't matter and that they should try together. They exchange handshakes, but Shun is so frail that even a light squeeze aches. Three gentlemen are heading out to eat ramen noodles today, but the business owner is Ricky who wants to play games, but Shun prefers to eat out. The two men then argue and decide to go to the game. They both choose air hockey, with the winner being the first to nine points. Despite Shun using two pucks, Ricky scores the first goal of the game. Shun, mischievous, crouches down, tells Ricky to find his possessions, and then attacks him unexpectedly. After, thanks to dirty techniques, both teams have an equal score of eight, but Shun, who plays so unsportsmanlike, nevertheless wins the game. Ricky is working at a new grocery store. Seiki, Shun, and Aaron go in to see how he is doing with his sales. Customers who come to buy goods strangely do not utilize the vending machine and instead assess the price themselves. Ricky is the one who broke the vending machine. Later, the owner comes out and states that he could only be like this because of Ricky, as he had a heart attack last week. He informs Ricky that he could sell goods himself from now on. So Ricky keeps looking for work at the ramen shop, but he still spills people's dishes. So the three guys invite each other to work as bartenders, and Seiki transforms Ricky into a different shape because no one would hire the old face. However, he continues to throw water on the customers' heads, and the other guests curse loudly, causing Aaron to become enraged and punch them. How is it possible to work like this? Today is the big day for the 10-kilometer run. Harrow takes the lead at the start of the race, and Ricky catches up with him after he buys water, leading Harrow to cry out and accelerate up a group of males. Here, they invite each other to take a taxi. Shun and a few other boys are too exhausted to run, so Seiki cleanses their fatigue to assist them in recovering and continuing to run. 
Ricky runs backward and still outruns Harrow. So, Harrow plays dirty by saying there is a new ramen restaurant opening, which distracts Ricky and allows Harrow to cross the finish line first. The others return as well, and Seiki returns on turn 44, while the girl group will run another day. Takomi bought a cake today to play at Seiki's place. However, the neighbor boy is present as well. Seiki's mother greets Kakomi cordially, and when she opens the box, there is also a heart-shaped cake. It's a bakery gift, and Seiki's mother thought Kamai bought it for her kid to eat. Kakomi also wanted Seiki to eat it first, but the other boy eats it first, breaking Kakomi's requests. Kakomi doesn't have time to talk to Seiki alone after eating the cake because the three of them go out to see Superman. She walks away, but the neighbor boy stares at her like the villain in a superhero movie, ready to harm her. Yes, that is very sad. Seiki's father has grown up but is still interested in creating superheroes, and when showing Seiki the model kit, the cat runs over and smashes it. But he has to let it go because he likes cats. Seiki eventually agrees to pick up the cat and carry it out. Then this damn cat chokes on a chunk. There is no other option, so Seiki has to grow small enough to enter the animal's throat and remove it. At this moment, Seiki has to keep his small shape for an hour, so the father tries to bully him. But no, Seiki helps him create 720 yen. Seiki also picks up a 500 yen coin, but then cockroaches start running out. So Seiki summons the robot to combat the cockroach, but the cat appears and pats the cockroach to death. So Seiki begins petting the sea but Seiki had already gone to the bathroom, and when he returned, the room was very silent. It turns out that everyone was sweating because of Ricky's singing. Everyone continued begging Seiki to sing. But when Seiki handed the microphone to Ricky and requested a duet, everyone fled. Today, the Seiki family visited Seiki's outhouse in the isolated countryside. Grandmother greeted the family cheerfully, while grandfather had a frown on his face. It was just the expression on his face, but the grandfather was as thrilled as a child for his daughter to see him in his room. But after learning that they would return the next day, his countenance grew gray, so he walked out to grab a newspaper to inform them that they might stay for two days and three nights, and he was finally given his request. He was overjoyed when he learned that his grandson Seiki would bring tea and cakes. But when he began to get serious, he saw his son-in-law come in, so he became enraged and chased Seiki's father out. While he was angry, his nephew brought in the food, and just as he was ready to speak, the nephew left. But because Seiki loved him, he brought another part for Grandpa to eat that night. They lay close and muttered something, but it was only a dream. Another day, the entire family went to the amusement park, which was in disarray when they arrived. The roller coaster even had screws fall out, so everyone went home. However, because the father indulged his wife, the three Seiki family members rode a roller coaster, nearly killing the father, and his mother had to pull him in. Seiki and his grandfather were on the Ferris wheel. But it ended in disaster, the ferris wheel broke down while they were seated. Despite his fear, he held Seiki and sought to protect him, which caused Seiki to have a different opinion of him. And thus, the two husbands on both sides of the bench lay nemesis. Seiki's family had to go home this morning, but grandfather didn't want them to go, so he took out the tank and faked the car was out of gas. But Seiki was aware that the gasoline was in the trunk. Going a bit further, they came across a landslide, as if the gods were blessing their grandfather to achieve what he desired. But Seiki's parents informed him that Seiki has abilities, and so their family returned home. The grandparents stood there, looking back, reminiscing. Seiki purchased a new game today, and he wore a ring to prevent his ability to read his opponent's mind and play the game better. The majority of the circumstances in the game revolve around Seiki's daily life, which entails him hiding from his pals in order to go home as soon as possible. In general, it's a typical passable game. Rita got immensely popular among girls after being the victim of a musical ghost following her terrible performance. And at the time, there was a person who mistreated his lover. Thus, Reed nearly defeated him thanks to the ghost of a kung fu teacher. So, the girls at school began falling in love with Rita and seeing movies with him. But while going down the street, the singer's ghost and the kung fu ghost took turns trying to enter Rita's body, and eventually, no girls followed him. Today is the first day of operation for the club Reed formed, his own mystical club, in order to establish his own harem. And when he entered the club room, he observed a long-haired female. It turned out that the female student who wanted to join the club was unsightly without her bangs. Sean and Yum then joined because Sean is crazy, and Yum is in love with Shun. It from then on. Hongu is a delinquent third-year student who wanted to abuse Seiki, but then Mr. Matsu comes to our aid. The teacher informs Seiki that this was his former pupil, and that he wants him to graduate. So Seiki decides to assist him in changing. 
he continued to abuse the students on the street, but Seiki telepathically changes his mind and proceeds to the barber shop. When Seiki puts him to sleep, he awakes with a crew cut. When he arrives at school, he proudly displays his spiky hair to Mr. Matsu, but the teacher exhibits no emotion, which makes Kongo upset. Seiki was going to be hit, but he sends a message to his brain that when he made a mistake, Matsu was the one who apologized. When the teacher notices the new haircut, he becomes emotional but tries to contain it. Kongo plans to change and put on spectacles after hearing this, but Miss Sister Matsu states that he would have to retake a year because he took too much leave. If that's the case, then why the heck should you study today? The entire class goes to sing karaoke, and Seiki is only concerned with the fruit ice cream cup. Everyone sings together for a time after Seiki orders the ice cream cup, and then the ice cream cup is given to someone else. Ricky requests Seiki to sing with him. Shun, on the other hand, thought he liked the new female, but he hadn't yet seen her face. Seiki, Haro, and Shun were on the same team for today's culinary class. Their initial results were abysmal, but Mira was so hungry that she ate them. Shun resumed cooking, but this time he threw the egg directly at Mr. Matsu's head, therefore, he received a reprimand. Haro tried as well, but another dish was sent to the motherland. Mira did not criticize and even drank the batter. Kekomi has her own crazed fan base, but because she is so close to Seiki, that crazed fan base kidnaps Seiki to question him. They incorrectly believe the neighbor boy is his and Kakomi's legitimate child. But when they saw Kakomi so happy with Seiki, they recognized that her happiness was what they wanted to safeguard, and they all went without untying him. Today, when Seiki was walking home from school, a baseball was thrown at him, and his power control gadget was damaged, so he needed to patch it immediately or it would be deadly. Because a single touch can cause a person to fly away, he leaned on the wall and knocked it down, so he had to rebuild it. He met Ricky at his house, so he had to distract him, and then he teleported home and requested his smart brother to help him fix it. So his parents pushed Seiki's wheelchair to Seiki's brother. He recalled that when his brother was born 18 years ago, he could pronounce his first sentence at one month old. So at two years old, he could study like an eight-year-old, and his IQ was 218. He was dubbed a genius, but when he was three years old, he encountered a major impediment, Seiki, with his superpower. So when he was 14, his brother left and didn't see him for four years. The father realized at this point that he had forgotten where he had placed the bag containing the bits to assemble the controller. But owing to the camera technology, Seiki's brother was able to swiftly discover it, finish assembling the controller, and give it to Seiki to wear. However, after wearing it, Seiki was unable to read his brother's thoughts. The apparatus on his skull, it turned out, was blocking Seiki's telepathy. Seiki's brother could already ride a motorcycle when he first learned how to ride a bike. If the brother received just a few hundred points, he would receive 9 million points. As a result, he had to travel abroad. Two players play rock, paper, scissors, and when they returned to the hotel, Seiki noticed Sean and Ricky were also present. His brother had invited them to play catch around London at the time, and he reasoned that by inviting the other two, Seiki would have to limit his use of his skills. If Seiki won, his brother would arrive this afternoon with a cake feast. When they heard the bet, they went over to tell Sean and Ricky that they were going to play hide and seek while he socked Seiki, and the two of them hit. The kids had 30 minutes to hide anywhere they wished, and as they were hunting for a hiding spot, Seiki noticed his older brother parachute in before Shun fainted. The three of them got their bicycles and ran for a time before the brother drove his motorcycle down from the skies. They curled their buttocks and kicked each other. They dashed into the shopping area after discovering my control device has a locator, and their brother proclaimed it over the loudspeaker, generating a commotion. They had to flee to the bathroom. When the brother thought he'd won, he opened the door to find out it wasn't Seiki. Seiki had mesmerized the individuals in the room and had escaped upstairs. Seiki triumphed once more. They all went to the gallery today to look at the images. Shun evaluated the artwork like a high school literature instructor. The following room was filled with childish decorations. Ricky draws a painting in three seconds, but the vice president of the museum comes out and wants to display it. Shun also draws a painting, which is flatly rejected. When Shun returns home, the director comes over and sees Shun's painting, which he praises for its beauty. How is this even appealing? Everyone encourages Seiki to engage in events as they prepare for the forthcoming summer vacation, but he declines them all. While stepping out the door, he notices Kakomi has a pair of tickets to the amusement park and wants to invite him to go. 
so he leaps out the window to hide, but the pair of tickets somehow flies out the window, enabling Kakomi to discover Seiki. He has to gather a throng to make Kakomi feel uncomfortable and force her to leave. Then, in order to avoid being revealed, he accepts Rita's invitation, and from then on, more people begin scheduling until the summer calendar is totally booked. He is so enraged that he pinches Rita's face, causing her entire facial structure to deform. They go to Reed's place to camp together, and the two are looking for the person they like but don't know how to pair up, so they have to draw a group, and Hume isn't the same one as Rita. They appear to get along well, and Rita is also quite gallant, giving Hume a really loving sensation, until he meets the wild boar and abandons her. Yum's feelings for Rita vanished as well. The tennis training camp comes next. Harrow and Ricky are present. Ricky defeats the newly arrived coach. He senses his potential and asks Harrow to confront Ricky. The tennis match begins with Ricky and Seiki on one side and Harrow and another friend on the other. At first, there were only these two monsters, so Seiki directs the ball to another location to demonstrate that he couldn't join the club. But because it flies too far, he is welcomed. They would subsequently be asked to participate in Hume's research and swallow a weird drug. Hume's heart vanishes on the second day, and Ricky's right hand grows extraordinarily huge. Don't ask me what he did. The youngsters get fat and thin on the third day and giants on the fourth day. Seiki heals them consistently, and on the day of the test, Seiki alters their pill. But they still turn too young or too old and finally transform into two muscular people. When the scientists notice this, they assume it was the result of a mushroom effect. Seiki remembers the other two eating the mushroom. At this moment, Shun and Aaron take their driver's license tests. The next week, the theory exam comes first. Aaron, on the other hand, only knows how to utilize the signs to fight people, so the teacher gives them a plethora of theoretical books, and they quickly pass thanks to his hard work. Seiki had intended to go out with Kakomi on the last day of her summer vacation, but when she sees Seiki carrying the other youngster from the neighborhood, she decides to let him go to the lost babysitting location. Based on the boys' preferences, the three of them go to see the superhero show. When Kakomi is preparing to take advantage of the boy watching this show to bring Seiki out alone, the person who played the Aoki ran down and grabbed Kakomi up to act with her and her sweetness through all eyes. As a result, the crowd requested that the superhero defeat the monster. Siderman continues to kick the monster, and just as he is ready to finish, Kakomi exclaims, Let's win, Minoru. My binary is not only Siderman's name but also the name of the person playing the monster. Hence, the monster defeats Siderman with a single kick. As a result, Seiki has to act as the second Siderman. There is a highly wealthy Seiko firm, and today the chairman's son moved school to PK Academy to prepare for college. He had observed Kakomi and had decided to come here to ask her out. Seiko had rice water, lobster, carrots, and various other foods brought out to him for lunch. He also spent his family's money to gain access to Kakomi's fan club. At the time, Kakomi was hiding in the toilet. She reviewed her profile and saw that Seiko's family is quite wealthy, but she still adores Seiki. Seiko walks in and asks Kakomi to be her girlfriend. But Kakomi refuses because she is in love. It's Saki calling. Seiko pretends not to be spicy when Seiki enters, but he is actually irritated. So he transfers Seiki's father's work to Siberia, where it is all snow, and even accuses Kakomi's brother of having a connection with a 42-year-old lady. That night, he is sitting on the throne of money when Kakomi's fan team arrives to exact retribution for upsetting Kakomi. Seiko is terrified when Seiki appears in his room. Seiko promises to give him all the money if he departs, however, Seiki tosses all the money away. Only Seiko's bodyguards want them because Kakomi's admirers still want to assassinate Seiko. Seiki returns the money and directly smashes Seiko. Seiki brings his grandparents here the next day when the father is about to have a good time with the mother, so there is another day of trouble with the father. They plan to invite each other out, but Grandpa keeps begging Seiki's father to stay at home alone so he can experience the feeling with the rest of the family. Knowing that Grandpa is too much for them, they ignore him and go shopping. Ricky comes over to Grandpa, who is sitting on a stone bench, and believes there is a conflict. But the two get along quite well and go shopping together. He gives Seiki new glasses that night, but Seiki switches bodies with his father. He doesn't want to give it to his father, but seeing Seiki's parents and wife happy makes him happy as well. Shun calls the men to his house for a Halloween party today, but when Seiki comes, Shun notices that he is still dressed properly and encourages him to come and so he can dress up. 
Harrow and Aaron realize they need to dress up for the Halloween party, so one of them drapes a blanket around his body while the other ties bandages around his. Then there's Ricky, who doesn't even wear makeup, but everyone thinks he's a great monster. Shun smokes around with the three boys while they enjoy having sewage splashed in their faces. Sean then comes in afraid of Seiki. Seiko decides to act because he feels so humiliated. He asks Ricky to enjoy grilled meat and crayfish when he goes to meet Seiki's group. Then he spends 150 million yen to hire Ricky as his henchman. But Ricky continues to show no signs of agreement until he abruptly states that he will accept this luggage, leading Seiko to believe that all could be addressed with money. Ricky, on the other hand, empties out all the money, throws the luggage to a drowning boy below, and goes down to save him. Seiko knows at this point that money cannot solve everything. He grows into a pig overnight without notice. Um realizes this and decides to go for a run in the afternoon. But after a short run, she brings out a variety of food to consume to replenish her energy. Then she realizes these things are only agreeable to her palate, and she is looking worse and worse. Seiki snatches the last of Yum's food when she crunches on the grass. You imagine Shun watching her workout, and she is back in form and a little smaller than before. A few days later, even though recess had only begun 10 minutes before, this person requests Seiki to do homework with him. Another guy wants him to play soccer, yet another guy urges him to punch each other, and yet another dude is watching his sister at the school gate. In general, there are no ordinary characters in this series. They all unexpectedly return home before Seiki, but when they observe Seiki's departure, they call an emergency meeting. But Seiki also transports to a hidden window and listens in. Everyone wants to throw a surprise birthday party for Seiki, but his birthday is three months away, and tomorrow is father's birthday. They discuss all of their intentions to organize, but Seiki dismisses them all. Seiki is scheduled to be on duty the next day, but he gets away with it, and the group is astonished, believing they have to cancel the party. They all make their way over to Seiki's house and ring the doorbell. When Seiki reappears, they are celebrating his birthday, which makes him very pleased, but it is actually his father and Seiki has charmed the other's father. Seiki informs everyone that his mother is living alone and that his father has died while they are sitting and conversing, so they assume Seiki's father is dead, shocking him and explaining it was all a hoax. Then Haro and Eren chastise him. The cake is next, although I don't think it'll taste very nice, so Seiki reverts to its original form and people begin eating and conversing in earnest. Seiki's dad exits the gathering and approaches him, telling him that they are extremely good friends. Seiki goes down and enjoys the party after hearing that. 